Hello, everyone. Uh, we will now be moving on to our protests panel. In this panel, we will be discussing various protests across the world, including the Black Lives Matter movement, the women's rights movement in Turkey, and the recent protests in Haiti. Speakers that will be featured in the protest segment are Gerlene Larar, who works for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission's Director of Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs and the Director of the Mediation Program. Stephanie Gerard, who is a professor of criminal justice at Shippensburg University. Cole Goodman, who is a political strategist who has launched his own consulting company and Hafsa Gerdap, who is a PD, PhD candidate in women's and gender studies at Stony Brook University, and whose research areas are human rights and women's status in Muslim contexts. Our first question will be from Mackenzie to Professor Gerard. Hi, Professor Gerard. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Over the course of the last year or so, we have seen various social movements gain attention and momentum specifically regarding criminal justice reform. What progress have the groups behind such movements been able to achieve during this time of uncertainty? Well, I thank you. I thank all of you uh, for inviting me. It is indeed a privilege, especially to be with such esteemed colleagues and peers and friends on this particular panel. You know, the whole movement of protest, to be clear, is about social justice change and about people being heard. And what often happens in criminal justice is what I find is society likes to keep criminal justice, justice at arm's length. People are like, well, these people, they, they violate our social norms. Let's lock them up and throw away the key and hopefully perhaps Maybe if they're incarcerated, something might happen, good might happen to them, and then perhaps they can rejoin society. What's happened particularly with police and policing in America and the relationship of police to marginalized communities, which often have lots of black and brown people in them, is there has always been and has been fostered a great sense of distrust. And uh, because obviously law enforcement and criminal justice represents the power of the state. And again, most of the protest movements that I think we're gonna discuss today, one thing they all have in common is governmental power and people seeking more individual rights. So the reforms for the police, let's be clear, we are the police in America, as everybody is aware, the first three words of the Constitution are we the people. So the police represent us and we represent the police. If we didn't want law enforcement to do certain things, we, the people, control that power. Similarly, and I won't digress, but it's, it's as if the death penalty, for example, people, we, the people of the government, give the state that power over us. If you don't want these institutions to have that power, we in America can take it back. That being said, the reforms, I believe in my experience, being in criminal justice for 30 years, have been successful incrementally, but have been successful as a direct result of the racial reckoning and the protests that have been born from the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020. In particular, just yesterday, for example, I read how three law enforcement officers were arrested and charged for what clearly was excessive force in a police citizen encounter. Would that have happened a year ago, two years ago, three years ago? I don't believe so. So what I take from that, and that's just one incident, one anecdote from many incidents of new levels of accountability for law enforcement to respond to the communities in which they uh, operate and live. Um, and it is a direct result of the protests that uh, we are still engaged in, but most notably have really in, um, consumed the nation as of last May. Thank you, Professor Gerard. Our next question will be from Aaron to Attorney Lerar. 
Attorney Lerar, I mean, it, it's it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, how was your day? It's been good? It's been good? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to ask my question first. And um, obviously, if you'd like to answer, obviously answer. But if anyone has, you know, a response to your answer or wants to answer the question as well, anyone can do that once um, Attorney Lerar is done with their question. I mean, her answer. All right. Um, so my question is, um, what are ways we can spread awareness against racism internationally? We have seen, you know, especially in England um, recently, you know, players have been gone through racism, like because of a penalty kick, because of Euro 2020. Um, they've, um, they've, you know, racism is everywhere. We know that. Uh, what are ways we can spread, spread it, like awareness against racism internationally? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Aaron, for, for your question. And thank you for having me. It's such a privilege to be here um, with such a great uh, group of panelists. Um, so first, since we're talking about uh, protest, I want to share a cute, uh, a cute story with you, uh, especially as young people. Um, you know, young people don't always realize the power that they have. And I just want to share uh, the story of my second protest um, before I answer the question, if you wouldn't judge me. So in, in high school, so I was born in, but was raised in French Guyana, which is a French department overseas. And in high school, uh, we decided, we organized uh, as a school to march, to march down to what would be what is called the Ministère de l'Education, which would be um, the national school district that was in charge of, of our school. And we wanted to protest and ask for better uh, working conditions as students. We wanted better books and we just wanted uh, better circumstances uh, to prepare for our future. And in order to do that, we actually had to go on strike. And, um, and so the most, one of the most important aspects of a protest is accountability and buy-in from the group that you're trying to protect. So as a group of students, it was important that the majority of the students actually agreed to go on strike and agreed to march several miles up to an hour until we got to um, the Minister de l'Education. And one thing that really struck me is that the day before the strike, one of our professors, his name was Monsieur Brem, who was our Spanish teacher, and he said to us, any student who will have the audacity to show up to my class tomorrow <clears throat> when your comrades are fighting for you will, be in, will get in trouble. And there were two students who were absent that day, the day, you know, the day before the strike, and they actually showed up to class. And he said to them, how dare you? How dare you sit in class while your comrades, your friends are fighting for your rights? Should that strike be successful, not only will they benefit from the results, you too will benefit. So that's what protesting is all about. It's about a group of people sacrificing their time, their rights, their privileges, <clears throat> for the betterment of a community. So, and so that's, that's, that's one of my favorite stories of protests. Obviously I've been in many more protests after that, but to answer your question, first I will direct you to l'UNESCO. Um, I don't know how to say it in, in English, 
but if I uh, give you, it's an acronym for United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. So UNESCO, <clears throat> what the, their founding vision was born in response to the racism and anti-Semitic violence that occurred after the war. And their work is global in terms of making sure that we have cohes cohesion um, as, a globe, as global citizens. <clears throat> they foster peace, they foster diversity, they foster appreciation for, for I'm sorry, uh, for countries all over the world and also for an understanding and appreciation for peace and tolerance. So <clears throat> that would be the organization I would look at, I would look toward um, if I were looking for um, increasing awareness of how we can fight racism around, around the world. But in addition, understanding how different countries and how different cultures deal with racism, I believe it's important. For instance, and um, I got here in 1997, um, and I was a student in France from 1992 to 1997. And as a black student in France who had lived in French Guyana, most of my friends were French, you know, French citizens of French departments overseas. So to them, they were French, just like, you know, any blonde, blue eyed French citizen was French, they were French. But stepping on the soil of France is when they realized that just as I'm Haitian and I'm not French and I'm a foreigner, just like our friends from Cameroon, an African from Cameroon is not French, they too were not considered French. So when they talk to them, they talk to them just like they talk to me. And, all, and to them, we should all go back to Africa where we're from. So that's a wake up call when you believe that you're a citizen of a country, but you're not the right color is when you realize perhaps I need to unite with people of my color because to the rest of the world, it doesn't matter that I'm a citizen of that country. All they see before they, they ask me for my papers from, they asked me for my passport, I'm an African. So understanding that there has to be unity, understanding that regardless of where you come from, what you look like, I mean, regardless of what your paper said, what you look like precedes you. And we must unite and see how we can all work together so that all races, can cohabit peacefully and with respect. <clears throat> Thank you, Attorney Lerar. Our next question will be from Kennedy to Professor Gerard. Hey, Professor Mark. So my question um, for you right now would be, how has systemic racism throughout schools impacted the school to prison pipeline? How do we combat these inequities and Thank you. Uh, it, it's, of course, it's a lifetime of conditioning in America. Culture is defined as programming of the mind. And what has happened when uh, what they call America's original sin in bringing uh, Africans to America to exploit the African for free labor. Uh, and then once slavery ended, to keep Blacks separate in social settings, economic settings, 
um, the way that the arm of the state usually did that was through the criminal justice system. So what happens is, of course, uh, what systemic racism means, and I just, you know, to, to make sure we're all on the same page, I want you to envision an antebellum mansion in the 1800s. And it's a big mansion, and let's just say on a Southern plantation. And you can imagine the owners were white and that the enslaved people could never actually walk through the front door. That mansion is just like American society. It has four walls and a roof and a cellar. That's America, right? We have a structure of our society. And that is a system, if you will. Now, each room in the mansion is what we call, you could say, is an institution. Room one is education. Room two is healthcare. Room three, criminal justice. Room four, economics. You can rearrange the furniture in the room, but you can't change the structure of the mansion. So a policy, for example, everybody here I know knows Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 says no, we racial integration shall happen in public schools. That's rearranging the furniture in room one, but it doesn't change the structure of American society where the enslaved and you know today black people are constantly um, rerouted from entry to, to other uh, sort of freedoms that people enjoy. Because you can't imagine in our antebellum mansion that black people could move around the rooms freely. You had to move only by white permission and grace. And that still has a legacy today. So in our education system, systemic racism, how it has impacted, particularly now African-Americans, is we were always just a little less than. And when I say a little, usually, especially in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even up to the 70s, always uh, the black schools and the white schools weren't on par. When we did have integration, of course, some of it went well, some of it didn't. But what happened is, is because of societal forces, the, the black and African-American students were behind academically. And because of that, they didn't perform well. And some uh, side effect of that was that uh, they acted out or, or they didn't follow the rules. And what happened is, is they started to get kicked out of the school. So the school to prison pipeline is when you get suspended and you get expelled for improper behavior. And I use air quotes because studies do indicate that white children and black children are disciplined differently. And black children in particular are punished disproportionately to their numbers in the actual schools. When that happens, think about yourself. If you were, if you got expelled, you'd be embarrassed to come back. When you did come back to school, you'd have missed all of that course content that the class had been moving forward with. You're not going to be really engaged. What might happen if you're a young person, you might get angry. When you get angry, you might act out even more. And then the cycle continues because the punishment keeps getting harsher and harsher and harsher if you keep repeating the same offenses. And so eventually you don't wanna come back. And studies show that if you don't graduate from high school, your likelihood is that a life of crime might be attractive. So that's what is called the school to prison pipeline. And the role systemic racism plays in that is we really do have to look back at our legacy that started in 1619. But I will say this, it's very important and I really believe this, things are getting better. Just by all of you involved in the World Affairs Council, just by organizing this event, just by having us discuss these issues openly and honestly, things are getting better. I often feel that people get hope, feel hopeless that there's no end in sight. That's not true. It's simply not. Okay, so hang in there. You 
you know, we're doing our job to break down the barriers, but you as the younger generation are gonna carry the movement forward and you're gonna have less trouble than we did. I know that to be a fact. Thank you, Professor Gerard. Our next question will be from Aaron to Hafsa Gerdab. Hey, Ms. Gerdab, it's nice to finally meet you. Obviously, thank you for being here. Um, so my question is about, you're, you're a women's rights activist in Turkey. That's what I read in your bio. Um, so my question is, I just wanna know some of your personal experiences. Um, what was it like, you know, um, as someone who advocated for a women's rights in Turkey? Um, what were some hardships and things you had to face? Um, and, you know, something I don't hear on the news is women's, women's rights in Turkey. So, so why do you think that is, you know, first off? So that's pretty much it. So yeah, thank you. First of all, I am, you know, amazed to be here with you guys, such a, with such an enthusiastic young group who are sincerely concerned about human rights. So thank you for having me. And I echo professor with uh, Professor Girard in terms of, you know, believing in the youth. So thank you again. And as an activist working in human rights, especially women's rights organizations and different platforms, and also as a scholar uh, concentrating on immigrant women's experiences and empowerment today, I will um, touch on the issue that you are questioning, why we don't hear about the stories of Turkish women and their persecution stories. So I'm here to tell about that. So yeah, unfortunately, um, women's rights uh, in Turkey have always uh, moved backward and failed in the historical context of Turkey. Women have faced discrimination, subjugation, oppression, injustices, and the laws, most importantly, have failed to protect women's rights. Uh, I, I want to give a more specific example um, about the failure of laws to protect women's rights. Uh, Turkey has just withdrew. With, oops, sorry. Turkey has just withdrawn from the Istanbul Convention. Istanbul Convention is a very significant international convention uh, which aims to combat against violence against women and the Turkish government has just withdrawn from that convention you know, leaving women in more, you know, um, vulnerable conditions. I mean, the government who's supposed to recognize and protect women's rights, who should protect, uh, protect the rights of women against violence has just taken a step backward by this shameful action. Along with uh, this uh, devastating withdrawal incident, incident uh, the ongoing chaotic volatile situation, particularly since the uh, since July 15, 2016, there was a coup attempt in Turkey. Turkey's already deteriorating democratic instruments have started to fall apart because of the government's authorities' um, collective persecution of all political dissidents and critics. More than 130,000 people were dismissed from, uh, from their jobs. And those who dismissed include a substantial amount of women. Also, the government's uh, uh, harsh persecution has reached the lives of thousands of women, along with their infants and children, babies in many cases. The current administration um, uses arbitrary arrests and lengthy pretrial, pretrial detentions to imprison, uh, imprison courageous women who have opposed oppression in their own capacity. I hate to declare that these cases with numbers, but facts are facts and they are so important. The number of women arbitrarily incarcerated as political prisoners is more than 5,000 right now, uh, as of now, with a devastating increase. And among those persecuted are more than 700 mothers who have imprisoned with their infants between the age of zero and six. And in Turkey, unfortunately, imprisoned women and prisoners of conscience in particular live in unsanitary prisons and are denied their uh, rights to nutritional food, access to basic and complex health care and feminine uh, hygiene products. In spite of uh, the international ru rules and laws about the pregnant women and women in postpartum period, there have been several incidents of violence against and ill treatment of women in prisons, unfortunately. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to picture the situation in Turkey and I'm gonna go on with what we are doing. Furthermore, 
the discrimination and violence against women, including femicide, have risen drastically. In 2020, 300 women were killed. More than 150 femicide cases have been detected so far just in 2021. And pandemic, of course, has worsened the case in terms of uh, domestic violence and femicide. Now I'd like to talk about what we do, how we protest and how, uh, what we could do. As ASD, I'm representing here the Advocates of Silence Turkey, a human rights organization. As ASD, we organize conferences and panels. We write reports and submit them to relevant, relevant organizations and committees such as United Nations entities, including special reporters, Helsinki Committee, and CAT Committee. It's, uh, it, it stands for Committee Against Torture and more. We visit representatives, senators, and some other influential people and organizations to draw their attention to this issue and urge them to take concrete actions. We collaborate with other organizations such as you and uh, in different occasions. This is very important, guys, you know, collaboration in terms of sharing different causes, learning other stories, and as well as telling our stories. And when it comes to unprecedented pan, I cannot pronounce this word, you know, correctly, never, ever, but it's being used a lot in these circumstances, unprecedented pandemic circumstances, which restrict our activities. Uh, we have shifted to different strategies. We had to. So what I mean by this is that we updated the forms of events and protests and actions, action items. Instead of street protests, for example, which are in person, we organized a big virtual protest on March 21st. It was called Women's Rights uh, Virtual Protest, for uh, which hundreds of our volunteers from all around the world worked day and night, not only in order to organize that event, but also to promote to thousands of people. They also asked their friends in the United States, in Kosovo, in South Africa, in Norway, and more, for their messages for the women in Turkey. So there were hundreds of video messages of a lot of people from across the world in different languages on YouTube. And having a global spectrum, we reached out to more than uh, 130,000 people all around the world with this live streaming. We have also been organizing virtual panels, United, United Nations CSW panels uh, were done you know, through virtual organizations, so we attended them. We organized book talks, we organized different universities panels, all virtual. Another step uh, we have taken in this pandemic period is that we have focused more on writ written works, writing more reports and launching more books. And in this regard, I'd like to tell you about our books and how we produce them. Uh, we have been interviewing the survivors, survivors of the great persecution in Turkey to let the world hear the true stories of hundreds of thousands of people, including women and children. And concerning this, um, we have launched many books in which people can witness the experiences of different people. I am the editor of uh, one of those books called The Baby in the Bag, for instance. It consists of four people's stories, one of which tells the story of a mother who had to put her baby in a bag sedating him while fleeing Turkey through the border one night, illegally, of course, because the passports are seized. So sharing stories can create opportunity for caring these people. So I thank you again for the opportunity to share these stories, guys. And we have also organized events promoting the use of different means to champion human rights. Art and music are among them. Through art and song contests, we have encouraged talented people to use their skills to raise awareness about human rights issues. I can share their YouTube links with this team afterwards, if you want, of course. And after raising a wide awareness, we also encourage people to write letters to people in decision-making positions. In short, we try to do everything virtually that we do in person in non-pandemic circumstances. And finally, I want to emphasize that training youth is among the most significant works of us. I'd like to tell more about this. It, in the very beginning, this kind of works are initiated as training the young advocates. But then I've come to the realization that we learn from them. We learn from you more, not only in terms of you know, your energy, your dynamism, your open-mindedness, 
but also different strategies, very outstanding ideas of action, and more. So I believe youth input in advocacy in human rights work is of high importance. It's vital. And I also believe that besides young activists, yeah, activists own activity, activities, we should include youth in all the work we do. You should contribute to all the regular activities, studies that are carried out by adults in different organizations. In other words, youth and adults should combine in not only the specific works of youth teams, but also in all the works we do. Yeah, that's all from me right now. Thank you, Ms. Gerda. Our next question will be from Aaron Nicole Goodman. Hey, Cole. Um, if you if you remember, I mean, you were our first speaker. Um, well, back in the day, uh, you were talking about your, you know, like life protesting and stuff like that. So I'm gonna go back to that. You know, um, how did you overcome the challenges you faced while protesting at the BLM protest? In the, um, yeah, in the BLM protest at the Capitol. You know, you talked a little bit about you getting pepper sprayed. I think that's one thing everyone <laughs> remembered during the during the um, during the time you spoke with us. So I just, you know, tell everyone like about the time you protested and just a little bit about, you know, um, you know, how'd you overcome those challenges? Sure, so first first off, uh, can everyone hear me? Great, um, first off, I just wanna say that it's an honor to be here and thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you and to give a few thoughts. I also wanna say it's an honor to be on a panel with three incredibly strong, powerful women. Uh, and, and you guys really spoke into my heart uh, and I really appreciate being on this panel with you uh, and with all of the interns and everyone uh, watching. So I uh, want to start off by saying, I mean, um, my three other panelists really covered a lot. Um, so I'm just going to fill in uh, maybe some holes. Um, protesting, I want to start off by saying protesting is not glamorous one if and or bit. Uh, it's sweaty. It's hard. Sometimes it's very soul draining, but it also is incredible. What you are doing is not only saving the world, but you're saving your community and you're making your community uh, better. Um, I will specifically uh, a little more talk about the protests in Harrisburg because they were very, very, very interesting. Um, the first protest in Harrisburg, if I remember correctly, over 8,000 people showed up. And I think that's what was so special about BLM specifically is not necessarily the number of people that showed up, but the diversity of the people that showed. Um, uh, you had Native American brothers and sisters, you had LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters. Um, uh, you, you had uh, a, a, uh, the Asian American community um, all coming out in one unified voice saying, this is the time when we're going to speak up and say, not only Black Lives Matter, uh, but Black lives need to be cherished. Black lives need to be uh, listened to. Uh, uh, Black women need to be listened to. Um, and we need police reform in this country. So I think that's what was so special about BLM. And I think that's one of the many reasons why uh, it, it, it took off like a rocket when it came to uh, legislatively in our government and such, because it wasn't just black people out there saying black lives matter and it, and it couldn't be, and it can't be. Um, but it was especially our Caucasian brothers uh, uh, and sisters out there using their privilege that they do have uh, in this country and saying, we're standing alongside um, um, our African-American brothers and sisters and we're demanding change. So the protest in Harrisburg, uh, the first one over 8,000 people came out. Um, uh, the, the first part was a little weird because uh, I kind of turned to my left and my mom's right there. But then I remember that, she, you know, uh, Miss Joyce is a reporter at Penn Live. So I was like, oh, well, she could be, you know, she's not following me and making sure in her words, I'm being a good boy. Um, so, um, but I, that was actually a really cool experience being able at one of my first protests, being able to protest with my mother, who I know uh, attended protests back in the day as Pro Professor Gerard was uh, giving that history. So that was a very special moment for me as well. But what was very interesting, uh, and this is when even in my life, 
this is when I, I really just realized, I was like, my gosh, not only is our, our system broken, but uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, community fabric that needs to be rewoven. Uh, it's when we were on Front Street and uh, it, the crowd was uh, uh, surrounding police cars and saying, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. And of any large uh, crowd that is that large, there's always gonna be, as um, many people argue with police, a few bad apples who decide to do something that oversteps the line that then uh, has a negative impact on everyone that's there. And in Harrisburg, two people threw bricks at cop cars and one person actually uh, uh, threw a flagpole through a state uh, uh, or through a city cop car. Uh, and that's when we then saw the state police come out. And that's when uh, it didn't matter what you were doing there. If you were just there peacefully, uh, the cops got out, no questions asked, just started pepper spraying everyone, uh, started beating people with their batons uh, to restore order. Um, uh, and that's in my life. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I got, there was a, there was a, a, a photo of me that, uh, uh, as they say, went viral um, and was in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer and such of just like pepper spray and milk and uh, just dirt and on my eyes and I'm crying and two people are just carrying me off. Um, but I think uh, what's important to note with that, and I just want to say it again, at that point, it didn't matter what you were doing in that crowd. And that, that is something that is, is very broken in itself, because I believe that protesting is, it is, as, um, is, a, is an in very important American trait. And I think as young people, it's our duty to challenge corruption. Uh, it's everyone's duty to challenge corruption, but especially us as young people and everyone on this call as young leaders, it's our duty to challenge corruption and injustice. Um, but what did we see uh, uh, right after those protests in Harrisburg uh, and such? Um, because everyone came together in one voice and everyone uh, came together in unity, one thing that I think these protests proved is that, and something we need to remember is that our politicians work for us uh, and it's not the other way around. So because people were out protesting, not just in Harrisburg, but in Philly, in Johnstown, in Pittsburgh, everywhere across the nation, but especially across the state of Pennsylvania, the legislature took immediate action when it came to uh, police reform bills. And that's where I'm going to agree with Professor Girard that even though it's incrementally, things are getting better uh, and things are changing and things are happening in this country that have never happened before because now accountability is through the roof when it comes to police departments all across the country. And I just want to um, name some of those house bills right now. Uh, so you on the call can look into them more and maybe some things that are on the horizon. So right after the uh, George Floyd protest was done, we had House Bill 1841 that um, implemented that police officer applicants must release all employment information uh, from previous departments. Uh, that bill also says that agencies must record disciplinary actions taken against officers and set up databases, which is very important, a statewide database with which Governor Wolf has really pushed and when he came and talked to you in terms, I'm sure maybe he mentioned it, but a database to hold officers accountable. Um, and that bill, uh, 1841, 1841, also explains, uh, says that uh, police departments have to explain to a commission why is officer is hired if they have past offenses that are recorded from other departments, which is incredibly important. And some of the things I'm saying right now, you're probably like, what? Those weren't already on the books? No, they weren't because there wasn't that accountability. Um, but that's uh, something the protests have really uh, spurned. There was also Senate Bill uh, 1910 that uh, uh, implemented new training for police officer and use of force, community and cultural awareness, which I think is incredibly important because, uh, and I can speak for Harrisburg uh, uh, and, and Dauphin County, uh, there are a lot of cops that aren't from inner city Harrisburg. So to learn about the community, 
uh, learn about the intricacies of the community, even in communication, in, in, in what neighborhoods uh, uh, have a staple, who to talk to, stuff like that. That is incredibly important. And 1910 really pushes for that uh, as well. So right after the protests were done, that, that uh, our politicians saw the outcry. And what did we see happen after that? Change, legislative change, laws put on the books, not just at the state level. I know this is a question we're gonna have, but not just on the state level, but uh, movement at the national level and at local police departments as well. So I, I think that uh, you know we we are on the right track. We are we are on uh, the way. Uh, um, whether it's in BLM or us in uh, BLM who are BLM leaders or uh, in uh, legislative allies, we're on the right track, and we need to keep going. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Our next question will be from Kennedy to Professor Gerard. Professor Gerard, how effective is reform in policing when their systems constantly prove ineffective? Yes, and, the, and that is uh, the struggle. The struggle is for, it's, it appears for every step forward in social justice, there's two steps back. Uh, first you heard there was Black Lives Matter, which you all know started in 2013, which then got co-opted to uh, many different slogans, depending on which group wanted to, to use them. Um, nobody was talking about critical race theory before uh, George Floyd uh, was murdered. And so, it, it, uh, you know, and now everyone's trying to, again, to, to Cole's point, to legislatively change the landscape of how we talk and learn about race. Well, for me, that's a good sign. That backlash is a sign of progress. If, the, if we weren't making progress, there would be nothing to backlash to. <laughs> so, so it's true that the system is broken, but I always say, and I, I learned this as a trial lawyer when I defended poor people facing the death penalty at trial, that every time you point your finger at somebody, you have three fingers pointing back at you. And how I started this presentation is by saying, remember, people want to distance themselves from law enforcement and politics and government when it's us. It is us. And that's the thread through protest. Um, if the system is broken, we are to blame. But I, I, I do want to say, uh, but the, the, and we are the fix. We are on the mend. I do want to just... Uh, jump on a, another thing that Cole said. And again, I appreciate everybody what you're saying. I'm, I'm, I'm learning so much and I appreciate that. Cole said that we in this country have a duty to disrupt uh, processes that are ineffective, uh, not serving the people. And I always like to remind people, if you haven't already, please do read the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. The preamble says specifically, and, and of course, these colonial gentlemen, what they were doing is they were King George the Third. They were, you know, this is this is the gentlemanly way in the 1700s to do things. They were writing to the king to let the king know why the causes that impel us to separate. You know, they were letting them letting the king know what he had done wrong that would cause the colonies to break off and, and be independent. And in there, it specifically says that man who has natural rights, and of course, back then, they all believed that man got their rights from above, that uh, a, consti a government constituted by the consent of the governed, that is, it only works if we agree to the power that we give it, when there are abuses and usurpations. I can really say that word, but that's what it says, which essentially means the people are being abused. We have a right, nay, a duty to break off and dissolve that government. And many people don't appreciate today uh, that we in this country formed this country in an act of anarchy 
and protest. That's how the United States of America was born, by people who literally could have been executed by signing their name to that Declaration of Independence that said, you're not, this ain't working for us anymore, and we're going to start anew. And if you remember that, it's true that protest and what you do does, in this sense, heal the system. Is it broken? Sure. Get a lot of broken systems across the country. Uh, criminal justice and law enforcement is but one of many that isn't working well. Um, but the focus that what I think is different today is the focus on getting the job done. So it seemed like, you know, in the Watts riots, for those who are my age, in the 60s, it was sort of all one off and then back. In the 1992 Rodney King riots, you know, one off and then people came back. You know, the assassinations of the 60s, everyone grieved, everyone burned everything down. Every, everyone sort of paid attention because as Dr. King says, a riot is the language of the unheard. Uh, and, uh, you know, people always say, well, why do, you all burn, why do you people all burn your, your stuff up? We don't own it, first of all, that's why. And second of all, it seems that that seems to get everybody's attention because you ain't listening. Okay, and I'm, believe me, I'm not advocating for riots. I am never an advocate for violence. I'm 100% a pacifist. And I need to say that personally, and of course, you know, I'm here in my uh, in my role as a professor of criminal justice, where I teach, and but I speak specifically from my experiences, not necessarily those at Shippensburg. But I will say that uh, uh, when you know these one-offs have constantly demoralized marginalized communities, it's like we had your attention for ten minutes, and now we're back here. We had your attention and now we're back here. Literally since May of 2020, it's been spotlight all the time, every time. But you know, there have been sacrifices, you know, in Ferguson, Missouri and Michael Brown, uh, you know, Sandra Bland in Texas, uh, what happened to her in that jail, you know, uh, uh, Tamir Rice, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin. I mean, it's been over and over and over. And then there's a point after which there's no return. And that's where we are now. And it's, it really is for the better uh, because so many more people are engaged. And uh, I'm sorry to say that, you know, watching nine minutes of George Floyd suffocate to death, really, we've been saying that this is what has been happening. And again, not just law enforcement, just in America in general. We've been saying about this disparate treatment, it needs remedy. And now people really do get it. So yes, Kennedy, there are things that are broken, but we are gluing them back together uh, daily. And uh, I am one who's always filled with hope. Ken Kennedy, can I, can I add something to that if that's okay? Um, first of all, Professor Gerard, you've got me so pumped right now. Yeah, you're, oh my gosh, like uh, I'm up in my house saying amen and preach and uh, thank you for everything you're imparting today. Um, so uh, I just, I, I just want to make one point. I just want to make sure I, I get it in because I don't, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but just two quick points. One, um, many times protesting, and it just needs to be said, you, you Sometimes you are not, you, you can be in environments where you're not, you're not popular. I, I don't know how else to say it in the sense of like, you are, um, you may be the majority in the country, but like, uh, let me give an example. Let, let me give a little story. Um, we held a protest in Lycans, Pennsylvania. If you know your Dauphin County geography, uh, that is in Northern Dauphin County, which is like, I mean, rural. Uh, incredibly, incredibly rural. And the common uh, misconception actually is that everyone that lives in the rural parts of Pennsylvania are racist, hillbilly, uh, and stupid. And that I've heard that many times since moving here. Um, when we went up to Lycans, we had about 15 people. And this is the first BLM social justice march that has ever even been thought of happening in Lycans, PA. 
we're walking down the street. People have pre-made signs saying, when the looting starts, our shooting starts. Uh, we have people coming out of their houses calling us the N-word. Uh, we have people um, uh, throwing things uh, in our path, throwing banana peels in our path. But here's what's so special. And I think this is a real importance uh, of protesting that I think people forget sometimes. You never know who is watching you and who you're setting an example for. There were young kids that were coming out of their house, four and five years old, repeating what we were saying, Black Lives Matter and no justice, no peace. And their parents had to pull them in because they weren't on board, but the kids saw our example. We also had uh, on a hill, five gentlemen uh, that pulled out Confederate flags uh, and, 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 had, and, and kept yelling at us, y'all start looting, we are going to shoot you. We are going to shoot you. But what was so special is that two young men, and they, they look like they were about juniors or seniors in high school, I saw them standing out to, out to the side of our protests like the whole time. One had the Confederate flag on his pants, uh, had a um, Make America Great Again hat for President Trump. So my misconceptions started in my head. And I can be honest with myself. I was like, I'm a little worried about those two, you know? But they came up when the protest was done and they said, we live in an area and in a community where we are not taught about these things. And we wanted to show up to see if what our, our news that we watch is, uh, is true in saying you guys are just looters and rioters, or, or we wanted to educate ourselves if what truly does Black Lives Matter mean? What can we do in our communities? And we had a 45 minute conversation to the angerment of their parents who were telling them to, we gotta go, we gotta go. But they were like, no, we wanna learn about this. And I was even able to talk about how wearing a Confederate flag on your pants may be disrespectful to some people. So protesting is infectious. Being an example is infectious. And sometimes you may not be the most popular person, but as long as you stand by your morals and your conscience, uh, you don't know who else you're influencing and you're influencing by your example. So I just, just wanted to add that quickly because I saw the time and I just wanted to get that point in. Thank you. And I will just, I, in the, the difficulty and the problems that begin with stereotyping and thinking people are a certain way by how they look is really, I think, what Hafsa, her question, and to attorney uh, uh, Gerlin, uh, was how do we end racism? We have to, in our minds, stop the tapes. Oh, this person lives here, so they must be X. This person wears that, so they must be Y. And it's, it's simply not true. Thank you, Professor Gerard and Mr. Goodman. Um, our next question is from Mackenzie to Attorney Larar. My question is also directed towards Havsa, if you would like to answer as well. Um, we were wondering how social media has impacted spreading awareness about different topics and if it's still impacting protests from areas that you're interested in today. So is it me the first or? Either of you. Yeah, so let me give a very brief answer. So in Turkey, the freedom of sp speech is violated. It's restricted. So uh, media is silenced. Only pro-government media is really active. So social media and international support for the campaigns that we and also other human rights organizations have been conducting, their, their, uh, their uh, contribution is very important. So yeah, we are using Twitter, and Instagram and Facebook a lot to raise awareness, to uh, organize events, to, um, to take action, to urge the international human rights uh, community uh, for taking action and supporting us, yeah. And sorry, 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 sorry. So, um, you know, in our work, urging the leaders and decision makers from the lowest level to the highest, to take con concrete actions, this is very important. And 
I strongly believe that we we can and must uh, do this work by breaking prejudices over and organizing solidarity. So social media is very important in, in these terms too, because on, as you are aware, people are coming together, you know, regardless of their identities or ideologies or religions, colors, come together on social media to raise awareness or to take action. So solidarity in these terms is very important. And there should, in, in our work, there should be only one point in our minds while mobilizing in such an important matter. It's only our common combat, fight against violence, fight against inequality, fight against injustices, fight against violence against women, this fight. So if we do this in unity over social media or on streets, I mean, solidarity and political unity, then the strength we have, we will rise up. Polarization, because polarization divides us and eventually creates create so many different camps and this ultimately makes us weak so we have to use social media in in this regard too no i think um your i think your answer is uh, very complete i don't have anything to add great answer would you like, I know we are running short on time, but would you like to elaborate a little bit more about how social media and maybe protests have created sort of a reaction or change from government in Haiti specifically? Well, you know, Haiti is, Haiti is very different. Um, you know, when you, you talk about, I was actually looking forward to uh, answering a question about, um, protests in Haiti and if there has been any positive or negative impact on, um, on the government based on protest. Uh, when it comes to social media uh, in Haiti, I don't believe that it's really had an impact because uh, there's a distrust when it comes to social media. You know, we don't really believe what we see because a lot of it it's not true. Um, so I think in terms of social media and the impact of um, on protesting and results, it's more uh, in, in the United States. And I think what it does, what social media does is um, allowing you to reach more individuals that you would have been able to reach had you not have access to, to social media. You know, now you can really increase awareness and uh, organize quicker um, and having more impact uh, thanks to social media. Uh, when it comes to Haiti, you also have the, there's the issue of um, the internet. You have the issue of electricity that's not well uh, distributed throughout the population. And you need both. You need internet, you need electricity if you're gonna have access to social media. So the diaspora has access to social media, but not uh, you know, in Haiti per se. Uh, 